I'm proud to say, of course, that you've already heard I voted against fast track, fast track. I intend to vote against the TPP if it comes up. I've been very vocal that they don't have my vote. And I have tried to do a little bit of the background on the secret process. And uh, it's true, even a member of Congress has to go deep into the bowels of the uh, visitor center, all the way down to the most secure basement floor where we go to get secret briefings about international issues. You gotta go in there, you've got a limited period of time, someone has to sit next to you while you're reading it. It's, it's just unfathomable what we have to go through I mean, I can get more top secret information in a less secure room than I can looking at these trade agreements, which makes it very complicated for all of us. But having people like Sharon and others who have really done a lot of work um, and attempted to find a lot more about it has been useful. On the politics of this, I'm not convinced they have the votes. I don't know that they'll bring it up. It's, uh, I think it's a tough issue. It's tough for Republicans in an election cycle. It's tough for Democrats. And I, I know we, uh, we have members on both sides of it, but I think it's... Uh, certainly something that the administration's hoping to move through, all hoping we don't even have to see it. Um, and you're right, I don't think it'll come to the floor unless they think they have the votes, so we'll just keep hoping um, that we don't see it. They do have 90 legislative days. We don't have a lot of days in session this year, um, so it could come up after the election, which could be complicated too, um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I have been opposed to agreements back to, since I was a member of the House of Representatives and NAFTA came up. Obviously, that wasn't something we got to vote on, but it's just always seemed like it was going to be a bad deal for Maine. And I think, uh, you know, we know more than we ever did before that it really was. And while it's been devastating to jobs, it's also got a big impact. Um, things like the TPP on these issues that you were talking about, Cynthia, and others earlier this this strange thing they call the investor state dispute system, which is a little hard to understand, but I think anything that requires a tribunal of lawyers just shouldn't sound that good to you in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, Janet and others, not to, you know, anything against lawyers, but you get a lot of lawyers together and then you call them a tribunal. It just doesn't, something doesn't sound American. And it certainly doesn't sound like the democracy and, you know, the legislative bodies that we all work so hard to make function. Um, and so the idea that you could have uh, this system that would be stacked in favor of big corporations who have interests where the deciding factor is about how the company's profits will be impacted, I think is something that most, you know, most Americans would think that's not how we do something. That's why we have a government. That's why we elect our leaders, is so that they can make these decisions. So to set up an intentional agreement that would undermine that is kind of unthinkable. Betsy mentioned the cool country of origin le legislation. That's an issue I care deeply about and I worked on. And the idea that could be kind of overthrown really based on, um, you know, just the thought that we would have lawsuits against us. When we worked hard to get that through Congress, I mean, everybody thinks it's a good idea. Don't you want to know where your meat comes from, where your food is packaged? Don't you want to know those things? But um, yeah, exactly. I mean, it just seems like kind of a basic right, and particularly here in Maine, we care about the sovereignty of our state and these other issues. So, um, and that's not the only time they've done that. Um, the dolphin safe labeling for tuna, um, they interfered with that, and there are a lot of those issues. Uh, you probably just read recently um, this whole thing about Maine lobster, right? So that's a $10 million industry here in Maine. Anybody who represents a coastal community knows what a huge impact that is in our district. $150 million impact to the state. And that's just, you know, the Sweden decides that they've found some renegade lobsters that have escaped and somehow, I don't know, gone on a cruise ship, gotten themselves to Sweden. <laughs> They're living it up. This was a hard one for me, too, because we got right on that, and I'm half Swedish, so I want to, you know, i got to call my people over there. I did volunteer immediately to go to Sweden, you know. <laughs> Someone has to go call the relatives and see what it says. But, but I mean, that, they're saying, you know, that they can catch lobster. I mean, they've got all these sort of really trumped-up reasons. No science is going to back them up, and we're hoping we can take them on on that. But it's probably a restraint of trade. It's probably that. They have a small lobster industry. They don't like the idea. Um, that our lobsters outcompete them, and who wouldn't rather eat a Maine lobster than anything else? Um, but that could have a huge impact on us, um, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Um, and we're not just talking about that. We're talking about a lot of countries around the world um, that are trying to get cheap seafood into our country, and I think you know how hard it is for fishermen in our country to sustain a living, but this is seafood that often comes from countries where they don't have the same inspection standards that we do. There's already a lot of issues around shrimp that gets imported into our country. Much of it is 
grown in dirty ponds and unsafe environments, obviously labor standards that we don't agree with. There are recent stories about people who are kept as slaves on fishing boats. I mean, just things that are unthinkable, yet the consumer is not going to know without country of origin legislation, without a proper inspection. All these things could have a huge impact on our environment, our economy. Um, there's a lot of scary things in the TPP that I think are also reflective of what we have to worry about here. One of the ones that really bothers me is this harmonizing commission on regulations. So let's just say um, the EU right now has GMO labeling. Um, this harmonizing commission would use a variety of standards that have much more to do about how well corporations do on making money than what citizens and consumers want. And they would decide kind of behind the scenes how to make sure our regulations fit in with each other. That could cover things like antibiotics and livestock feed, things where the EU is already way ahead of us and we'd like some of their standards to start having an impact on us, but they could kind of harmonize them behind the scenes, growth hormones, hormone injected beef, all kinds of other additives that we allow but would like to stop allowing. And so they could kind of use opportunities um, to undermine what we could do legislatively. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm very worried about that. Um, I was thrilled to see your timeline because I think it's a good reflection of how hard you have worked on all these things, but also how much success we've actually had to this point. And that's really the only other thing I want to say. I mean, I hear from hundreds of Mainers who oppose trade agreements. It's very rare, honestly, that we hear from somebody who thinks we should do something about it. Occasionally, a business will come to us who has a very narrow interest in this. Um, usually their arguments aren't even that great or they're representing an international corporation and there's some relationship to the state of Maine. Since I've been in the legislature, uh, I've probably heard from thousands of people who have seen the impact on it. I think Mainers know in their guts why this isn't right for us. And I think that's why there's been a lot of pressure on the delegation to do something about it. And I just want to end by saying, um, and I know you know this, but I don't think you, you can ever underestimate what a tiny little state like Maine with 1.3 million people can do to have an impact on some of these huge federal policies. We were talking a little bit earlier about GMOs, and I do a lot of work, of course, on food and farming kinds of rules. I'm lucky enough to sit on the Agriculture Appropriations Committee, and so we can really d d dig in deep a lot about, about a lot of these things, but it's also something I've cared a lot about since the 70s when I was a board member for MOFCA and seen the opportunities in a state like ours as we've had a resurgence in agriculture, as we've had, you know, younger people getting into farming, people finding new ways to hang on to the family farm, huge opportunities from the organic markets that weren't there before, but have really started to create a revolution. And we want to make sure that goes along with good prices and good standards and all those other things. And what I was going to say is we were talking a little bit before about the recent GMO labeling bill that failed in the Senate. And it failed with um, our two members of the U.S. Senate voting the right way, the right way in my opinion. Um, and I think that's because they heard from a lot of people in the state of Maine, and they heard from a lot of people in the state of Maine because it's an issue we know a lot about. We care about it. We have bills before the legislature. There was just the one that passed on uh, the right to food, which is a, a big, um, uh, bold move and very exciting. We have 17 communities that have passed food sovereignty laws. We have a very highly educated um, consumer base in our state because people care a lot about the rural economy. They want to support farmers. They believe it's better to buy local. They want healthy food. And the fact that our legislature passed a GMO labeling bill a few years ago, and it was a bipartisan bill, and even our um, challenging governor uh, <laughs> signed it, but that said it was, you know, it mattered to both sides of the aisle, um, meant that um, we had two senators who were going to vote the right way, and I think it's been an early um, driver of a big change. So the GMO labeling bill, um, the bill to prohibit GMO labeling and to prohibit states from having laws about it failed in the Senate last week. And almost immediately, um, you heard from General Mills, uh, Mars Candy Bars, Campbell Soup had already come out, big corporations that were saying, oh, well, if you can't beat them, join them, who were kind of, I think, throwing up their hands and admitting defeat. And I actually think, well, this will be the end of the opposition on that. And in big part, those things have to do with the little old state of Maine and the people who have been working for a really long time on these issues, 
the consumers in the state of Maine who write me more about this issue than practically anything else, and the way they've been able to influence our delegations, our leaders, and set the tone for what's happening around the country. So I guess the way I look at it is, what is the point of coming from an amazing state like this where often common sense wisdom prevails and we have a huge impact on the rest of the country, if we could have trade agreements like this that basically um, allowed corporations to get their way. In the end, we could have all the success, we could fight through all these things and find out that in the end, the system was rigged and we couldn't get what we wanted, even though we have a state that cares about our so sovereignty, we have a state that cares about democracy, that brings people together on both sides of the aisle and things we care about, and then in the end, these trade agreements could take it all away. So I know you've worked very hard on it. I think you will be part of helping us to prevail on not passing this piece of legislation. So um, keep up the great work. Thanks for letting me be a part of it with all of you.